Thanks a lot. So this is a presentation about a research bid. It's a research bid uh, that we've recently submitted. Uh, we're really excited about it. It's an enormous amount of uh, preparatory work, uh, pilot work as well. And it's all about the first ever systematic study of medieval horses and war horses. Uh, and really the first point I want to make is that uh, the, the, the project's got a, a much wider brief than purely looking at the Norman Conquest. It's a systematic study of horses and war horses between 800 and 1550. Uh, so I'm going to give you some highlights, really, as they apply to the, the Norman period generally. Also to stress, it really is a, a multi, another example of a multi-proxy project, really looking at a whole variety of different evidence and trying to integrate it. That's the, obviously, this, this workshop's all about inter, integration. Uh, we really hope that it'll be an exemplar of that, looking for more, more of the traditional material, pictorial material, a seal here, of course, some material culture, the documentary record, and also some really cutting-edge science, and that's what my colleague Alan is going to talk about later on. Um, so that's the, the second point. Also to stress, really, it's a, whereas it's a, we style this as a, a project about horses, we want to look at horses, you know, not for the sake of looking at horses, not just looking at horses and, and human-animal interactions. We really want to think about horses as a window on the wider medieval world, and in particular, questioning what horses can tell us about wider socio-cultural change. Okay, so this is a slightly more formal um, introduction, I guess. The project is taking the view that the war horse is the most iconic animal of the Middle Ages. It's absolutely central, as we know, to arist aristocratic identity. It's really closely bound up with concepts of knighthood and chivalry. It's absolutely critical to medieval life and society. However, established understandings are really hinged on historical work. Davis's um, excellent book, the, Me the Medieval War Horse, is, is purely a historical account. We take the view um, that archaeological approaches have been generally neglected and where archaeologists have studied horses and war horses, they've looked at them in a, in a disconnected way. People have looked at material culture in ways, discrete studies of, of bones and zoo archaeology. The landscape dimension, I suggest, is, is completely untapped. And my colleague uh, Rob Liviard will talk about that later on. So the archaeology is um, disconnected. In terms of studies of the Norman conquest, I guess the crucial question is, it's a question that's been thought about by historians, you know, are there such things as Anglo-Saxon war horses? Do the Anglo-Saxons have war horses? Or do you see sudden change as a result of the Norman conquest? Or are you looking at longer term continuities? This phrase, the horses are, as a military revolution, has been thrown around again by historians. Do we see a single military revolution or a series of revolutions or incremental change? Perhaps a more interesting question building on that, is the horse an agent of change and social change or is it the symptom of change? So those are some of the questions that are particularly relevant to the, the Norman Conquest period. So after that brief introduction, I'll, with a couple of slides, talk about the material culture side of the project, then handing over to colleagues to, to think about the archaeological science and the landscape dimension. So first of all, in terms of equine material culture, essentially there are, there are two categories of material culture we're interested in. The first of them, I guess, is completely irrelevant for this particular seminar, horse armour. Horse armour is thought about endlessly by um, art historians, but archaeologists, from an archaeological point of view, um, horse armour can give us, provide an index of, of, of changing horse morphology. Which simply hasn't been thought about in that way. That's slightly irrelevant for this particular workshop. Um, the main part of our work involving material culture will be to build on the database of the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Since this uh, 1995 study, the medieval horse and its equipment, which dealt purely with London, of course the, the data set has completely um, exploded. So we want to map and investigate that in different levels at different scales. So two further slides on the material culture. I think this is a fascinating image. This is a tympanum of a, a church in Dorset, a place called Fordington. Uh, and it shows a very late 11th century scene, the intervention of St George here in the Battle of Antioch. He's slaying Saracens who are dressed as Norman warriors, as, as you see. The particular item I'd like to highlight in this slide is what's around the neck and the breastband of St George's horse. If you see this, this um, breastband here, these are harness pendants, they're decorative pendants hanging off the horse. 
Um, these are interesting objects in, in many different ways. I just want to just flash up this slide really, showing two particular groups of harness pendants. So these are decorative pendants that hang off horses and war horses. The examples here date to the 11th century, probably the, the, bit, the earlier part of the 11th century. The examples here date to the 12th century, probably the middle of the 12th century. In terms of what this tells us about the Norman Conquest, very, very briefly, um, there's no you know, very, very clear line in the sand, no, no obvious change as a result of the Norman Conquest. These 11th, early 11th century examples, I think, are showing that Anglo-Saxon, perhaps Anglo-Scandinavian society is becoming very horse-minded, very equestrian, long before the Norman Conquest. The examples over here in the mid-12th century are showing that harness pendants, they're becoming very, very decorative, very showy. They are um, representing aristocratic identities in new and different ways. It seems to be really characteristic of the middle years of the 12th century. Um, this this is, represents the, the Warren family, a known family. This, sorry. It moved onto the screen. The kind of just disappears into right. <laughs> so this Shecky uh, design represents uh, the, the Warren family. These seem to represent shields, as you can see. This lion, Passant, is that a heraldic or a proto-heraldic device? It's the first time you see these devices cropping up on the material culture. And finally, just to throw an idea out there, there are suggestions that this type of design, which you do see in the mid-12th century pendants, you see circle with the... Um, sun-like um, design. There are suggestions that that's a representation, take this or leave it, of Halley's Comet. Without, <laughs> with, with, without the tell, is there any sense that's perpetuating a, a memory um, of the Norman Conquest? So some brief thoughts about the material culture. Over to Alan. Right, so what about the horses physically? Um, so I'm going to think about the, the bones. Um, been quite a, a lot of consideration of change in, in horse size, but that really is what, what has generally been considered previously, is, is whether there's evidence for particularly large war horses or, and, and just basically um, physical size from doing very simple linear measurements most of the time. Um, and people will use, in order to reconstruct the withers height of the animals, they use a set of uh, values called Kieserwalter factors, which come from a very obscure German paper published a very long time ago that may or may not bear any relationship to the real shape of horses or not, because I don't think anyone's checked to see if they actually do work, but that's what everybody always cites and everybody always does. So we have a very vague idea for some linear measurements about overall change in horse sizes, and those exist in, in works already, in works by people like Anne Highland and, and so on and so forth. Now, without going out and doing further analysis, you could get a little bit more into shape and do what the graph over there does and start taking different ratios against each other so you can begin to think about robusticity and things like that. And that's some work I did uh, about 10 years ago on, on horse domestication in, in Kazakhstan showing, showing changes in, in, in robusticity. So you can get a little bit further than just doing size and we could do that using published data. But we want to go really rather beyond that. And um, of course the thing to do at the moment um, to be up to date in this is to use geomorphometric morphometrics. Um, and, and this is not something that has, has been done on, on, on horses in this way at all as yet. Um, the picture here shows um, one of Greg Larson's and um, uh, Keith Dobney's dog project um, uh, GMM in process where they're using um, um, photogrammetry to create their 3D models. Um, and so that's, that's uh, them doing that. This is one we did on, um, uh, on a horse astragalus from um, Oakhampton Castle. Um, now, uh, you can do it with laser scanning or you can do it um, with uh, photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is a lot cheaper and uh, is, is what a lot of people are using now. And we would propose in this study um, to look at astragalus and calcanium with GMM. Now, geometric morphometrics works differently from linear measurements. Instead of taking just a measurement from there to there and potentially doing ratios or whatever of those, you take a whole series of landmark points that are identifiable points around the 3D structure. And then it, it does the uh, whole pile of geometric calculations you do in multivariate statistics between all of those to give you a much 
much more detailed view of shape in a way that you can actually eliminate size completely from that as well if you wanted to really look at the morphology of an animal. Some work has been done on horse GMM already, but on teeth. Um, but the teeth are really only likely to be showing you um, relatedness. The, 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 the enamel folds in the teeth are like, likely to be very closely related to the genetics. In fact, that's what's been shown in terms of relatedness. Now, actually, we are after something slightly different because you don't, we don't just want the relatedness of horses. We want to know a little bit to do with their shape um, and actually their functional morphology and uh, what the breed might relate to in terms of their functional morphology. Now, if you choose the, choose the astragalus, why the astragalus? Two reasons. One is we need whole bones to do GMO, and these are the ones which are likely to survive whole in an easily identifiable form that we could do it on. It's also joint enclosed, so it's less affected by changes that happen during an animal's life as a joint enclosed bone. But it will be affected potentially by breeding animals for different locomotor properties. So that's, that's um, one of the reasons we would go for it, to see if there is a particular breed related to particular functions. And we can associate those different functions with different types of sites and different contexts the bones are found in. But we'll also look at calcanium, because the calcanium comes off the astragalus, and it's not joint in place, and it's a lever. So it'll have some elements which are to do with the genetics, but it also might have some development that are actually related to physical activity in life. It actually might develop some in life activity related change as well as a, as a lever that lies outside the breed models over the lifetime. So we might get both of those things. Both of those are very easily recognizable horse bones, very easy to identify, more likely to survive whole. So this the idea as to why we would target those ones in particular. Just to show you the sort of thing you can get from um, this. Um, obviously this is a proposal so we haven't done it on lots of horses yet because it's, uh, but, but I'll show you an example of using stragglers in 3D. This is from one of my previous PhD students' work, Ashley Haruda, and she did um, uh, work on um, uh, sheep astragaly to look for breeds and land races within um, uh, Central Asia. And so this is, this is, these are the um, points that were taken as the landmark points around uh, sheep astragaly. These are a set of um, scans that show the range of shape variation uh, that was gained in the data set that, that she had. And in the canonical variance analysis there, you can see actually that these different Bronze Age sites, in this case with sheep, cluster out very nicely, showing that these different sites did indeed have their own different land races, uh, breeds, if you like. Um, so it does, it is, it, you know, it's just something that we know, we haven't done it with horses, but we know it's something that actually works very effectively in other species. So that's the, what we propose to do with GMM. Now also, as is the current vogue, the thing to do would, is always to integrate the GMM work with genetics. Now our project doesn't actually itself have to do the genetics because Ludovic Orlando already has Project Pegasus running and I'm part of that project anyway um, and he's already got as one of his work packages to do um, British horses so we would actually completely integrate what we do with all the evidence we have with what he's going to do. Um, now, the, the bone that he most favours for getting whole genomes out is the Petrus bone, as, as most geneticists do. I, I joke that the, the geneticists come along and steal all the ears of, um, <laughs> of our skeletons. And this is me, in fact, doing some ear stealing for Ludovic <laughs> in, in Kazakhstan, poking out the Petrus bone. Now, obviously, the genetics can show you which animals are related to each other, but, but actually um, much, much more than that um, in terms of all sorts of interesting things. Um, tell us an awful lot about the, what the horses were like. We, the, the horse is, is an animal that has had its genome pretty well mapped because of all the interest in race horses. A lot of money's been put into it. So this panel that runs up the middle are a whole series of interesting um, um, allele position, uh, uh, alleles that, that indicate different, um, different types of things within the horse. The top set uh, are all to do with insertions that um, um, control coat colour. So you get to be able to see what the colour of the horses were, and so you may, maybe there is some selection deliberately for different coat colours for different uses of horses that might match with different morphological characteristics and different sizes and so on and so forth. But then you've also got diseases and um, nasty things that come along with that, things that relate to locomotion and things that relate to size as you go down that. So all of those things we can relate directly onto that. Um, there's a little graph over here 
which shows what he calls the genetic load, which is, um, is, is the amount of all these deleterious disease things that we manage to introduce through inbreeding animals too much. And it just shows that we managed to mess up all horses. Um, <laughs> so there you are, these are, these are some ancient, and very recently, recently, people used to think this was the cost of domestication. But we've now seen it's not the cost of domestication. Here are some ancient um, civilians, these are Iron Age ones, and you've got a low genetic load of these different um, diseases. But then, um, then you've got all of these more recent horse types, and actually there's an awful lot more he's done since this graph, which shows that there's, there's no horse alive today that we haven't introduced a very high genetic load of disease to by putting them through various bottlenecks of intensive breeding one way or another. Um, even Chevalskis are messed up from having been in New York Zoo and coming back out again. Um, so they are all got a high um, genetic load. And you can also look for kinship, different levels of kinship within, within the groups. So if you start combining all of that information um, with, um, with the material culture information we have, the physical evidence of their changing size and shape, the association of those with different sites, you're beginning to really develop things. And then onto what yes. you can then add to that. Thank you, further. Uh, landscapes. Thank you very much. I'm very conscious of the time uh, as well. Uh, okay. Okay. So the, the third tranche of this potential project um, concerns landscapes and horse breeding landscapes, in particular um, horse studs. I mean, what we plan to do in the project, but of course this is a, a kind of research agenda in its own right, is to firstly map uh, the evolving network of studs through time, something obviously based on documentary sources, but secondly, develop key stu um, case studies of key sites where we can undertake more archaeological work as well as bring a greater range of historical sources to bear. So on the mapping, um, what we think it would be useful to kind of do is to take all documentary references to horse studs from Anglo-Saxon England onwards up to about the 16th century with a view to analysing their spatial patterning. Um, these documentary sources are plentiful. What you can see there is a 14th century <coughs> document referring to the purchase of Spanish horses uh, for a royal stud in the 13. Uh, uh, 30s, there are the many of them out there, but crucially, the way these sources have been used in the past, uh, well, they've been tended for economics, really, how much, the cost, how much the beasts cost, what is the cost of the fodder, what's the cost of stabling, what are the costs of, gro what are the costs of grooms, that sort of thing, rather than investigating, well, where are they uh, um, uh, and uh, when are they there? So what we would want this exercise to, to do is to show patterns of ownership um, and also the lifespan of individual stud sites because some are transient, others are quite clearly very long-lived enterprises. Um, Guildford Park, Gillingham Park, Woodstock Park, Wood, uh, Windsor Park are all important studs in the post-conquest period and they continue to be important up into the 14th century and beyond. So clearly very long-lived um, enterprises. Um, and we think a range of stud biographies or site biographies, if you like, would be a very useful addition to our knowledge rather than simply there was a stud here at this particular point in time. Now, I've already intimated, but of course, it's very well known that there's a tendency, at least by the high Middle Ages, uh, that there was a well for studs to be so to be associated with deer parks. Uh, you can see why I'm involved in the project. Um, and, but the way in which the study of parks has evolved means that in a very large number of cases, we can, with high confidence, plot their bounds and their extent within the landscape. And what you can see on the right-hand side there uh, are a series of, of, of Anglo-Northern parks from the, uh, from the 11th and the 12th centuries. Guildford, I've just mentioned, which you can see down there, um, that's mentioned in Doomsday. It's important royal stud for centuries afterwards. Um, depending on where you stand on these things, it might be that that is an Anglo-Saxon, you know, horse breeding uh, um, en environment. But it follows, if we know that there's a stud in a park at a particular date and we know where the park was, we might be able to find archaeological signatures of studs and of horse breeding. Well, the example that we know best is this place, Agglesthorpe Park um, in North Yorkshire. Uh, uh, this was uh, plotted by uh, Stephen Morehouse. It was published in the Deer Parks book I edited some years ago. And what you can see, it's really quite an extensive site. Uh, you've got the footprint of many buildings there and a whole series of en enclosures to go with it. Now, there must be more of these out there, uh, and, and we would like to find them. And some evidence 
from the pilot, which suggests that there is. Uh, what you can see here is a LIDAR plot of features within the medieval deer park at Mere in Wiltshire, which was the site of a stud of Richard Earl of Cornwall in the mid to late 13th uh, centuries. Now, what we want to do is to hit these sorts of places with the conventional tech techniques, aerial photographs, LIDAR, geophysical survey. Uh, we also want to do cartographic um, analysis, documentary analysis as well, to see whether or not there is a distinctive archaeological footprint of these places. I think you can agree, if you look at these, sorry to leave the screen, but if you look at the, the collection of features there, that does at least superficially seem to quite closely resemble what we've just seen there um, at Agglesthorpe. And things like place name evidence I think is quite important here. If you can go to somewhere like Capel Bank Park in Yorkshire, that's Nag or Horse Riding Bank Park. I mean, that's quite interesting. Now, we do know that, that, that parks, some parks have very specialised horse breeding uh, uh, roles, functions. Do they have an archaeological signature? We'd like to find out. So, the idea of this project is to integrate those three things, material culture, zoo archaeology and landscape archaeology, and hopefully take our knowledge forward. I was reminded here of RHC Davis's comment some 30 years now, specifically on whether the Anglo-Saxons had war horses, but nonetheless what he said is quite interesting. He said, and I quote, we have to hope that archaeology can produce some results. Yeah. Um, if the peer reviewer of our AHRC project is in the room, um, uh, we think it'd be quite a good project. Please be nice to us. Thanks very much indeed on the behalf of all three of us. Thanks very much.